The Women of Ill Repute, with your hosts, Wendy Mesley and Maureen Holloway. So, Maureen, we, we have a, a man of <gasps> Ill Repute this week. A man. A man. A man I sort of know, but not really. I mean, do we really know anybody? Uh, but Who this is this? It's Roz Weston. You Roz Weston. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I have to explain. For almost uh, for five years, I worked at, at Rogers Radio at CHFI, host of the morning show. And the studio right next to ours uh, it was the KISS 92.5 studio. And Roz was in there every morning. And I think I saw, I met him, maybe saw him twice in five years. But you know what? He was the coolest guy in the building. So Maureen, like really, you you like never saw him? That's, that's No, no, I did. I saw him. I saw him. But he was legendary for not being particularly social. But it was like it was like high school. He was like, oh, you know, the, he's the cool guy. He looks like a rock star, but nobody really knows anything about him. The only thing that I knew about Ross was he was obsessive about mowing his lawn. So this is a guy who looks like a rock star and he's obsessed with mowing his lawn. I mean, mm-hmm. picture a rock star mowing his lawn. That's Ross Weston. So as far as I know, a bit of a contradiction. No. Yeah. You know, OK, so Ross has written a book, uh, which yeah. we're going to talk to him about a memoir. And he describes himself as a kind of a contradiction, having above average confidence, but low self-esteem. Well, there's a few people like that. I didn't have the office next door, uh, so I I didn't know him. I saw him on the billboards and all like I know he's a big deal and everything. But then I read his book uh, because we were going to be talking to him and I and I learned well, I always thought I was a workaholic, but apparently I was not a workaholic compared to him. I always thought I had kind of like crazy love affairs. And then I read about his love affairs. Oh, my God. He also talks a lot in the book about losing his dad. He lost his dad to cancer. He was young-ish. He's sort of burdened by guilt for all. We can talk about that, too. The cancer, the guilt, all of that. But the really cool stuff, I learned that I'm not the only one who has a problem with, with turkey. And that perhaps... <laughs> That's your takeaway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that there's a reason that it comes with all that shit on the sides, you know, the gravy and the cranberries. Yeah, and it's, a ter- it's a terrible bird, but he has a turkey recipe. So hopefully we'll get for that. Roz is sitting right here. It must be really weird. But welcome, Roz. I'm so glad you're doing this show. I have so many questions. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. That was the greatest introduction, I think, of all time. Really? Well, we didn't even say that you were 17 years with Entertainment Canada and that you do the show while well, Roz and Mocha, you do the morning show. We didn't even say any of that. We just sort of leapt right into you, you're, you have great hair. Turkey recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, thank you for for having me. It's um, it's really incredible to first off talk to um, both of you <laughs> one mo finally. Um, <laughs> after all, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's sort of a joke with the the people I work with, where they keep threatening to bring people into the studio that I've worked with for fifteen years and ask me what their names are. <laughs> and and I'll, and and it, the way the reason it started that way was because I when I was when we started the radio show, I was already doing ET Canada, and so my days were getting up at three thirty in the morning, going and doing the Raza Mocha show, and then I would leave. The show would finish at ten, and I had to be in makeup for the TV show at ten thirty. Right. So I had to get from A to B. So I missed out on all the staff meetings. I missed out on everything. Like I just wasn't part of that world. I like my career with the radio show was to literally walk into the studio, do the show. As soon as we turned off the microphones, I was gone. Like I, I wasn't part of the social structure of the of the company or or anything like that. And and so I think a little bit of my r- later reluctance to even bond with people, you know, came Because it had been so long, I think, you know, as well. And then I think that I got to the, to a point with so many people that it would have been weird had I gone up and talked to them. And then there's like a little (laughs) bit of embarrassment and there's a little bit of like insecurity and like all of this other, all of this other stuff. And so it fit my life perfectly to just sort of go and do the show and then, and then get the hell out. But you secretly fantasized about, about Mo, right? Oh, stop. Of course. (laughs) Oh, go on. Of course. Oh, go on. (laughs) I didn't even realize that you'd left ET Canada because I I, I didn't Mm -hmm. watch. But so that was fairly recent. Um, So you picked radio over television or was it that simple? Or was it just too much to do both gigs? 
No. Well, see, I wrote I wrote the book over two years while doing both shows. So I was doing I was working 13 and a half hours a day for the radio show and the TV show. And then I was writing 30 hours a week Jeez. is the way that my schedule sort of sort of broke down um, over that year and a half that I wrote the book. And I knew that I could write a book and work two full time jobs, but I couldn't launch a book and work two full time jobs. I couldn't sort of give this the life that it needed. I needed to be able to do press with people that weren't the company that I worked for. I needed to, you know, be able to go anywhere at the last minute. I needed to be able to do this stuff in the middle of the afternoon, which I wouldn't have been able to do. And so I, ET Canada had gone through a lot of changes. A lot of the people that I loved and were great friends of mine were no longer there. And it was time and it was, and, and I made the decision to, uh, to walk away. And I'm, I, you know, I do, I don't regret leaving the show. But I don't have the freedom that I thought that I was going to have. I thought that I was going to be so overjoyed with having all this time on my hands. And I find that I'm just getting antsy. I, I've never not had two full-time jobs in, in almost 20 years. And so I thought that I was like going to come home and life would be great. And, and I find that I don't, I don't have a place to put that energy anymore because mm. I'm, you know, the, book is, the book is written. It's out. And, and I don't know what I'm going to do next. But I'm not relaxed. Like I'm not content. You've never been relaxed or content, I don't think, from you, judging from your book. But doesn't this sound familiar, Wendy? I mean, this is this is what yeah. a lot of people go through post retirement. Yeah, it sort of changed for me when I when I had a kid, um, and and she's now twenty four. Uh, you've got a thirteen year old, so good luck with that. <laughs> I remember <laughs> when our daughter was thirteen. Oh my god, it's very strange. I was telling my husband about how you were working these two amazing jobs like very time consuming and you were working, I think you said somewhere you were I, something I saw anyway in the research that 30 hours a week of writing the book. And he says, yeah, mm -hmm. there's some, there's something about you people. And he means like people like me and Maureen and, and you that you need to like live out loud. I mean, what, what is it? I mean, yeah, I'll, 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 I ski like a crazy person now because I don't have seven jobs anymore, but what, what do you, <laughs> how do you explain it? So I think that in this business and, and I, and I talk a lot about this in the book because I think it is relatable to not only people in our business, but to people in, in other businesses as well, which is when I was younger, I was so focused on chasing opportunity and making sure I was damn ready for it when it came because I never wanted to, I never wanted to fall back. And so I was an opportunity hunter and what that wound up putting me was in a position where so much of my self-worth and identity was locked into what I did for a living and who I did it for. And I became very uncomfortable with that idea because my father had sort of gone through that. And then once I stopped chasing opportunity, I shifted and I started chasing creativity where every day I have this insatiable urge to just get an idea out of my head and into the world, you know, make something, you know, beautiful because it's much more difficult to make something beautiful than it is to point out all the things in the world that are ugly. And so now I chase creativity and that is something that I can't shake because I enjoy it too much. It's so incredibly fulfilling and it does no harm to anyone and, and it only lifts me up. And I got pretty good at being me because I, I don't think a lot of people are really, really great at being um, themselves. And so that's where I find myself now is just this incredible, ferocious need to be creative constantly and one less place to put. I love the idea that you take whatever's in your head and it's either comes out as a, as a radio show or a podcast or a book painting. Yeah. And, and, and that, and that was it because I, I was, you know, I was just so obsessed for so long with, you know, advancing and I, and I, and I refused to ask for help and I didn't want to schmooze and all, all of this stuff. I had a lot of like issues with asking for help and that led me to a place of where I was shutting a lot of people out. So any opportunity that came up, I needed to feel like I earned it 100%. Hmm. And that didn't leave me in a great spot. Um, one, it didn't leave me with a lot of friends. And two, it left me feeling like my entire identity and who I was was tied up into what I did for a living and who I who I did it for. And so I, I switched that. And then I, I instead of chasing uh, opportunity, I started chasing creativity. And that's sort of where I am today. And that's kind of where the book came from. Um, the book was originally very different from the book that was that was released. But I think a lot of books are, and, and, and I, think that's, I think that that's, you know, fine. Um, but that was all part of that process, right? About the actual 
art or task of writing. I found it really, in, there's a lot of, you're such a, a contradiction in so many ways. And one is that you don't, you said you don't read, you were no. an indifferent student, and then you write a book, a best selling book, yeah. which pisses a lot of people off. Right. Not that you don't deserve it, but yeah, you don't deserve it actually. No. Like, because, you know, it, did it just come to you that, I mean, never, you didn't write short stories. You, what, how did no. this happen? It was like, fell a gift from heaven. Yeah. I've written more books than I've read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I will, I will say this. Yes, I was, a, I was a shit student and, and I didn't do all that well. And I thought I was going to be a rock star and I, all of, all of this, all of this stuff. But I realized l- sort of later in life, in my, in my early twenties, all the things I did not know. And one thing that I knew is that I was not particularly smart. And so I made it my mission to sort of educate myself with the resources that I had through various jobs that I had, um, library and all of this, all of this other stuff. And, and the one thing that bothered me the most is that I, I didn't know how to write. I wasn't, I wasn't a particularly great writer. And then the, the, the more writing I did, I realized that working from company to company and in all of these sort of different shows and in all the different departments within television and radio, when layoffs happened, the best writers were usually the last people to lose their jobs because they could work in promo, they could work in news, they could work in all sorts of all sorts of areas. And so I made it my mission to just be a to to, to be the best writer that I that I could. And now I write constantly, like I'm just always, 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 always writing. But all of that happened much later in life. Like I I didn't come out of you know college with this you know great you know well read sort of incredible vocabulary. I was quite you know um, ignorant. And all of that happened. You know, all of that happened later. I was like a very very typical late bloomer. So the book is called A Little Bit Broken, um, mm. which is a quote from- You mentioned the title until now. It's called dad. A Little Bit Broken. I'll yeah. So why bit. are you broke? I mean, you've got rock star hair. You're tall. You're, sure. you're successful. You're like, <laughs> like yeah. wh- uh, why did you end up a little bit broken? One of the things when I sat down to write this, write this book is that I, I was obsessed with the notion where we are today that- we don't fix things anymore. We replace mm. them. And whether that be friends or our phones or relationships, you know, we don't fix things anymore. We, it's, if it's broken, we replace it. And, it, and it's that. Or easy just go on it. Tinder and you swipe and you, you know, you just, yeah. And, and that's, and that, that's it. Like a $900 phone. Like it's, you know, there, there's no fixing anything anymore. And, and so I was, I was a little bit obsessed with that because my dad was a fixer. And my da- everything, everything in his life got a second chance, and it wasn't particularly done well. And he wasn't artistic, but when he was done with it, it would work and it would do the thing that it was supposed to do. But everything got a second chance. And when I sat down to write this book, because my dad, you know, was dead, and he died at a point before there was a lot of permanent record of people. I don't have any audio of my dad. I don't. I don't even think I have any video of my of my dad. You know, we have sort of photo albums. And one of the things that I realized is that. You know, when I go, so will, you know, him basically, right? He goes when I go because my brother and I are the sort of, you know, keepers of his stories and we're the ones who will tell his stories, you know, when, when they're gone. And I wanted to leave a permanent record of my dad, right? Because I thought that he deserved that. And I felt like I owed it to him because he was so incredible. And, and I didn't just do it for my dad. I sort of did it for all the dads that were great and then disappeared. And once the people who are around to tell their stories are gone, they're gone. And that was heartbreaking to me. And so a big part of this was making sure that there was a record that he was awesome. <laughs> The women of ill repute. Wow. What about your mom, Roz? You didn't talk to her while we were writing the book. No, my mom found out that I was writing the book the day that I sent the book to the printer. <laughs> so I'm I'm thinking of the movies and, you know, the mom is calling all the time and saying, hey, in this case, Roz, pick up friggin' phone. Like, it's kind of weird that you didn't talk to your mom for, for two years. Like, why? while you were writing it must have been hard but we we talked we talked but we didn't talk a lot it was covid 
right? And mm-hmm. and and so we weren't seeing each other a whole lot anyway. I would go and, and bring them stuff if they needed me to bring them stuff, and we would text all the time. Um, but I really I really disappeared for for the most part for two years. But I think that for her it was kind of understood because I was always so busy, and then with COVID doing both shows and everything else, I don't think she really questioned it much. And then, and then I called her one day and I was like, Hey, listen, I gotta, I gotta meet with you. And then we, I still couldn't go in her house. So it was, right. you know, it was, it was cold outside and we sat in a little park um, in front of her apartment building. And, and I told her, I was just like, listen, you know, I, I wrote a book and here is what it's, what it's about. And then I went through some of the things to just sort of prep her for it because there was a lot in the book that she did not know. And I told her, you know, I told her that I used to hurt myself. And because I thought that that was one of the things that she sort of, she needed to know first because it couldn't be the second thing I told her. And so I told her I used to hurt myself and then, and then I told her why. And, um, and then we hugged and we cried. And then she was like, oh my God, you wrote a book. She's like, I've been writing poetry. And then she got out her phone (laughs) and she started reading me her poems and we sat there and we, and we, and we, and we hugged and, uh, and it was a really beautiful, it was a really beautiful moment. And she wasn't pissed at all. I think that that's sort of, she knows me well enough to know that, you know, that's how I operate and that's how I do things. And I'm very secretive with, with things. Um, but well, but when she, wife. when she did find out, yeah. Ooh, who's not your wife, your partner, your, your, right. your yeah. fiance. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's like, it's the end of the book. Like you, you, you were going to propose, you were using your book to propose to the woman that you've been with, the mother of your 13 year old daughter. I mean, tell us like what happened and are you getting married? Did she say yes? Yes. Yes. She did say, she did say, she did say (laughs) yes. And uh, we are getting married. It's going to be in the summer. And she finally got a ring because I I couldn't do that ahead of time. I, I, I knew going into this that I was going to propose the, the very first line that I wrote in the book was when I sat down to write the book, I knew it was going to end with a proposal. And when I tell stories, I always tell stories at the end first. I need to know where I'm going. I need to know how I'm getting out. And so when I sat down to write the book, I wrote the line, um, when you find somebody to spend the rest of your life with, you're also f- finding the person who will tell your stories when you're gone. And if you're lucky, you'll find somebody who only sees the best in you. And so I wrote, I wrote that and then I put it aside and then I went back to the beginning and I wrote all the way up to that point. And Catherine, um, my fiance, she was a part of the writing process from the very beginning where I would finish a chapter and I would take my computer and I would put it on her lap and I'd be like, do you have 15 minutes? Read this. And because there was so much that she didn't know. And so then, you know, she would have questions. Sometimes we would sit and laugh together. Sometimes we would sit and cry together. Um, and, and so she was part of the process the whole way, but she didn't know how it was going to, how it was going to end. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to end the book that way was because I knew it was a tough read and I needed people to know that there was a happy ending. I needed people to go into it with optimism because it's not an easy book to read, but I, I, I I wanted people to know that there's an extremely happy ending and to go into it with sort of like, you know, heart wide open. This is all going to be okay. It isn't an easy, it's, it's, Spots. It's hilarious. Your your childhood stories are both hilarious and horrendous. Um, You know, reading it is. I'm a mother of two boys, and I'm like, oh god, this. Like, I can understand why your mother would be surprised by some stuff. But I want to talk about not about about writing about such personal stuff, and yet not naming names and not uh, not just professionally. I mean, we've Wendy and I have talked to a number of people who've written memoirs. And let it all hang out for better or for worse, usually for worse. You seem to have managed to find a good balancing act. The only people that I think that I know that you mentioned are Julie Adam, who is our boss, and Carlos Ferrari. (laughs) Ah, right. (laughs) Son of a bitch. (laughs) Some guys bully. (laughs) Those are the Um, only two people like that you actually name. And the rest Yeah. There, yeah, there, there are a few, there are a few people who, who, who I did. Um, there's, there's reasons why there's certain people in my life that I, that I didn't name. Um, and I don't even give them fake names. I don't give them any name. One, because I don't think revenge makes for great memoirs, right? Um, so that was, that was a part of it. And then the other part of it too, is a lot of those stories and a lot of the people that I'm talking about, this is stuff that happened 30 years ago. And I like to believe that people change and the people I'm writing about were the people they were then, not the people they are now. And I Mm. don't know them now. Mm. And so that was a big reason why I didn't put, put names in, you know, Maureen wants to know the, the names. 
<laughs> yeah. I can figure, you know what? I can figure out quite a number of them because. Uh, oh, any, anybody, anybody yeah. could. Yeah. Right. Any, you know, any, anybody could figure out, you know, who they, who they are. But, but I didn't write it as a, I didn't write it from a place of sort of vengeance because, you know, I don't think revenge makes for a great memoir. And, and the, the people that I wrote about that were, you know, sort of truly, you know, awful to, to me, um, this was 30 years ago. And, and I wrote about the people they were then, not about the people they are now, because I don't know them now. Mm -hmm. And I like to believe that people can change and that maybe people have changed. And, and it's not that I felt like I owed them that sort of bit of anonymity, but I didn't want the focus to be on an individual. I wanted people to read those stories and see themselves in it. That's why there was no target. Yeah. But that being said, we want to ask, because we've all interviewed a lot of famous people. Between the three of us, sure. we have interviewed everybody. And you do name names. And I'm with you with, uh, with Alec Baldwin. I interviewed him years ago and he was a dick. Yeah, I mean, Alec Baldwin's notorious. I the, the interesting interview is Alec Baldwin's brother. I interviewed um, Which Billy one? Baldwin one time. Billy. Billy. I've interviewed all. The, I've interviewed all, all the, the Baldwins, bouncing Baldwin but, but, boys. <laughs> but 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 Billy. But Billy Baldwin was interesting because it was right after I. I it was right after that thing that the, the the story of the the Alec Baldwin story that I talked about in the book, and which was this, which was we were set up in a hotel room to interview Alec Baldwin, and there was camera guys and audio guys and producers and everything else, and there was um sort of like French hotel French doors, which are there's no insulation, there's no anything on them, and he came in with his assistant. He was sitting in the other room, and he picked up the phone and he was reaming somebody out over the phone. Like I've never heard a person scream. Probably his 10 year old daughter, human, another human being before. Yeah. <laughs> and this was not that long after that. Yeah. Right. There was the, there was the filthy pig daughter call. And then there was, and then there was this, and this went on for 15 minutes and we were, we were mortified and we thought that he was going to storm out of the room and leave. And the interview was going to be over. And he slammed the phone down and then walked into the room and was like, Hey guys, I'm Alec. And we were like, I, <laughs> Like it was, it was incredible how fast he, how fast he switched it off. Yeah. And so I told that story to his brother and he said to me, listen, if you think Alec is brutal to the people who work for him, you should listen to the way that he talks to his family. Oh, God. And he goes, and he goes, and he goes, Alec's problem is this. When he speaks to you like that, you can't do anything anything. If he punched me in the face, I could have him charged. But when he talks to you like that, there's nothing you can do. And he knows it. And that was from his own brother. He reminds me of somebody I worked with famously or infamously, similar, similar kind of rage. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it yeah. is brutal. But I mean, who's the worst person you ever interviewed? Can you name names? Um, yeah, sure. Like I'm worse. Like there, there's like, there's worse. I, I've, I have different categories of worse. Like I have different categories of best, um, worse. There's just people who suck at being interviewed. Yeah. Right. Like, like that sort of thing bothers me more than if somebody's a jerk, like I can deal with somebody being a jerk because really they're going to look like they're a jerk. But when you're just talking to somebody who's really, really terrible at being interviewed or giving an interview, there's not much you can do with that. Right. Yeah. I love the line in your book about how uh, they would always say no personal questions because you're yeah. interviewing a celebrity and celebrities get to set all the rules and people in the media business are so desperate to talk to them. They agree to anything. But I, Maureen knows that I always had this massive crush on comedians. So I finally got to interview Steve Martin and all he wanted to talk about was the group of seven yeah. i like uh, who doesn't love the group of seven like the yes. beatles are like yes. amazing but it's steve martin yeah. and yes. i agreed uh, i agreed and i only talked to him about his fascination with you know one of the group <laughs> of seven and he was at the ago and afterwards i'm like what about the arrow through the yeah, head yeah. like can we yeah. i didn't do any of that but you i mean you broke rules all the time didn't you i was i was hired to break rules Right. And that was sort of my purpose with the early years at ET Canada. And I have to say this because ET Canada did change and they changed in a very, you know, wonderful way. But in the early days of ET Canada, I was hired to go in and, and ask the things that we swore that we would, would not ask. <laughs> because this was before social media. And when we started the show, it was like TMZ had maybe just started and Perez Hilton was the biggest thing in celebrity sort of news. Right. And so they needed us then. They still needed us. And so we had the ability to sort of overstep 
And they couldn't say anything because if they had something to say, if they had a rumor that they needed to dispel, if they had a movie that they needed to promote, they still needed us. And so I was sent in there to overstep every single time. And that was my purpose with that show. And I got very good at it. Um, When social media came around, The Rock doesn't need entertainment tonight. The Rock can go on Instagram and talk to 25 million people plus, right? So it's a gift now when The Rock sits down with you. So that whole dynamic between celebrity journalism and the celebrities changed. And I think it changed for the better, to be honest with you. And I started to enjoy the show more once we didn't have to be gross. Because for for, for a lot of years, we were gross. But I, I really enjoy the show more, um, you know, in the in the last few years of the of the show. So Alec Not, Baldwin but, sucks. Who, who was great? Uh, Steve Carell's the best. Yeah. Aww. I met him a long Steve time Carell. ago when he was just starting. And he is a genuinely nice person in every way. He's very good at the game, right? Steve Carell, Paul Giamatti. There's a few others who are brilliant at the game because the game is, I don't know you and you don't know me, but for five minutes, we have to act like we're best friends. I'm going to make <laughs> you laugh. I'm going to make you laugh. I'm going to ask you one question where you're going to pretend to give me something that sounds like you haven't given it to 15 other people already today. And then we're going to shake hands and it's going to be awesome. Right. That's the game. Yeah. And Steve Carell Act. is one of the best at the game. Yeah. I did uh, Idris Elba once and, and it was the same thing. It was uh, like, I rarely agree to the, 10 minutes. You got 10 minutes with the superstar and then 10 minutes with somebody else. But I agree because it was Idris Elba and he's, mm-hmm. you know, he's hot. So I, I agree. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't, it was the, all of the rumors were about him uh, being the next bond and yeah. whatever you do, don't ask a question. And I broke the rule and he was, he was like that. He's like, we're best friends for five minutes, yeah. maybe 10. And, and he answered the bond question like, yeah, like, sure. Who wouldn't want to be bond? And and I was like, Oh, you're just so cool. But it is like that. Well, it is. There there is like a bond that happens. There is, there is. And the the biggest stars in the world never come with rules. That's the interesting thing. Hmm. George Clooney has never told you what to ask. No. Hmm. Brad, Brad Pitt has never told you what to ask. The biggest stars in the world, Sandra Bullock has never told you what to ask. The biggest stars in the world don't do that. And that is, I think, the level that everybody wants to get to. What we've learned, both from our other jobs and doing this podcast now for the past year, is we've learned to be very wary of publicists because they will, (laughs) they could change the dynamic of the, and then, you know, you can't talk about this or it, and and then you actually talk to the person. And I'm not going to name names because we need the, these publicists sure. to like us so we can get to the people we want to talk to. But they they put up a fence and they t- and they dictate. And I often wonder if the guest, celebrity, author, or whatever, has any idea that uh, that this is going on. Of course on. they do. I, I have I now have a publicist in Toronto and have a publicist in Los Angeles. You know everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know everything. I know everything that's going on because I pay them. Yeah. Listen, your book, you and Catherine actually designed it yourself. She did the photography and you designed it. I mean, you didn't just write it. No. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's crazy again, you know, creativity and obsessiveness and everything else. I sort of sat down to think about the, the cover of the book and Catherine's a photographer. She takes all the pictures of me and I wanted her to be a part of it. So I wanted her to take the picture. So I put it in my contract when I signed the book contract initially Mm. that, that I got to pick the photographer who was going to shoot my book. (laughs) I put it, I put it in there just so there was no, no sort of debate about it. And then, and then I started, you know, building it and I, I made a couple mock-ups and they just wound up liking it. And, and it was, it was crazy because, so this is the cover here, right? It's big, and it leaps out. Right. Yeah. I had this, my name and the the name of the book sort of different placed everywhere all, all over the book. And I had them all printed out and I left them on the dining room table in all the different ones. There was like six different ones. And I would come in every day and I would look at them just to see which one jumped out at me. And the closer I got to choosing the book cover, the sort of deeper I got into editing the book where I realized the things that I was going to be talking about. How you learned a lot. It's going to be. I, I learned I learned a lot. But what I also realized is that this with my eyes covered was the only version of the book that I was comfortable releasing. Wow. Interesting. Because I felt because I felt far too exposed mm. with this with this any anywhere anywhere else. Isn't that right. Funny? And so that's why they that's why they got that one. Uh, Wendy, you know that I ran into Roz at the the Storytellers Ball at the Writers Gala uh, last fall, and the one where yeah I, I tried to chase Margaret Atwood around the room. 
Yeah, I, and you were the only one who was all. I was the only. I had elf ears on, and because we were supposed to dress up, and I was the, one of the very few people in costume. But I, I, I saw Roz and Catherine. It was the first time I'd met Catherine. And uh, how was that for you? I mean, I was there as a guest because I knew it was some rich guy who invited us. But you were there as a writer with all the top yeah. writers in this country. It 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 felt really it felt really great like it was incredible you know I've you know you you write a book and most the thing that I learned learned about writing writing books is that most books you've read in your life and most books when you walk into a bookstore everything all through the shelves and even at the front most people spend two years writing a book for less than five thousand dollars right um, sounds like podcasting. Yeah, and that and that's why there are no more authors. That's why every author is an influencer or or an academic or what. There's very few authors anymore, unless you are Margaret Atwood and so on and so forth. You have to have a platform. If you don't have a platform, you're not going to get a book deal. You can self publish, but if you don't have an audience built in, because you have to market your own book, um, you, like a publisher won't even look at you. And so I have such great respect for writers because I realize that it is literally the most tedious, difficult, heartbreaking, awful thing you can do is to sit down and write a book. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it re- That's really, it really inspiring. Is. It's, it, it, really, it really is. But when you get to the end, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And so that storyteller's ball, while we were there and like, you know, I got invited to that as an author and, you know, I knew Margaret Atwood was going to be there and I knew, uh, you know, a couple of the other, a couple of the other authors. It was a really beautiful moment for me. That was the the sort of first outing we had with the, with the book. And I, I've never felt comfortable in those rooms. And I was sitting at the table with Catherine and she looked beautiful and I just wanted to get a picture. I don't post shit on anywhere, right? Like, it's just not my thing. I don't post a lot of stuff. And they had a picture of me on the front, of, like in the ta- like the, the centerpiece had a picture of me and my book. And I just wanted a picture of it. And I was trying to stage something as everything was going on. And Margaret Atwell was on stage talking. And I moved everything all into this little vignette. And I fucking set the whole thing on fire with a candle, <laughs> right? <laughs> and... And and Did I you went take a yes, and I went and I went from I went from not feeling like I didn't belong to actually looking like I don't belong, um, oh, that's and that's funny. sort of how that that's sort of how that night went for me. Um, but it was a beautiful night. I had a great time. <laughs> I think I heard about that, Ross. It's been wonderful talking to you. You said earlier that you're maybe not the smartest person, but boy, oh boy, you uh, you went deep and you exposed a lot and you've done a lot. And you mean a lot. I think that what you've accomplished in that book, I think, I think you're you're getting somewhere really important. A Thank little you. bit broken is published by Doubleday. That's usually how we end these interviews. I hope you write another one. I hope you just keep creating. No, with more names, more yeah, nuance, more, more names. names. No, I will. I will never do one of these. I'm really? Well, I'm I glad you did no. this one. I'm glad you did this one. No. I cried for two years writing this. I don't want to cry for another two years. There's no, there's no way I'm ever doing this again. I might do a cookbook. Yeah, you should. That turkey <laughs> recipe but, is amazing with the skin thing. I'm so doing that. I am so doing that. Before we go, I will tell you this. And I really love that you brought that up because that chapter that has the turkey section in it, right? That chapter was that part was in the book and out of the book and in the book and out of the book and in the book and out of the book. The whole time I was writing it because I would I would be proofreading it the, the book and then I would get to that stuff again. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm putting a turkey recipe in the yeah. middle of this book. And then I would get rid of it and then I would read it again. And I'm like, oh no, put the put turkey, turkey stuff recipe. back in. Absolutely. And then and at the at the last second I left the turkey stuff in. I think you should write a cookbook. I think you should write a cookbook yeah. full of stories. Um yeah. that would I'm be thinking great. About it. That'd be I'm great. Think about, about it. it. Yeah. Ross, um, your 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 wife to be is a lovely woman. I suppose this is not a shock. Thank you. <laughs> that you should no. love to Catherine. It was just a pleasure meeting her, and uh, we Thank wish you. you guys all the happiness in the world. Thank you. I and good luck with the teenager. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Roz. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate. Yeah, I I really appreciate both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Talk Roz. Soon. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we had a lot of technical problems with this, but hopefully we've cleaned them all up. Um, but what a, what a, well, he's a professional. He's a professional broadcaster. He should be a good interview.
Yeah, he does open up though. And I think, I think that's important. I think that's what the book is, is about, you know, like everybody who is a professional has yes. stories. And so some of the stories you hear over and over, but I, but I think he's trying to be, I think he's trying to be open and Genuine. honest and to figure out what, what the hell are we all doing yeah. here? Which is, uh, which is pretty meaningful. Yeah. So, so you're going to write your book? No, it sounds like a hell. <laughs> But you'll make five thousand dollars. You, if we have, I could get five thousand bucks. That would be amazing. No, it's uh, it was obviously very painful for him. Yeah, and he goes there, and all the dark, the dark underside of of, of being Roz Weston is there. If and it may surprise you if you are a fan and have been listening to him or watching him all these years, uh, where he's come from. But he seems to be in a good place now, and, and yeah, it was great. We never even asked him about. He's got Tourette's. Like how I many know. people have Tourette's? We never even asked him about that. And yet, you know, I mean, he has eye twitches and whatever, and they get better. We forgot to ask him. But it's in uh, the book. Yeah. We forgot to ask him about a lot of stuff. And we had technical problems. But uh, if you, it's a really good read. He may not be the best writer. He says he's a good writer, but he is a great storyteller. Yeah. So pick up the book and, uh, and enjoy. Women of Ill Repute was written and produced by Maureen Holloway and Wendy Mesley with the help from the team at the Sound Off Media Company and producer Yet Belgraver.